Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hey. How you doing? I'm doing great. We have another exciting day in front of us. Nice. I know. They're just all good lately, which is nice. What are we doing today? Today, we are talking about the third um, oh, DSRNP. Uh, Remember, we've been doing a series. A series. Of slightly deeper dives into each one. We did identity other distinctions. We did part whole systems. That's the D and the S of DSRP. And now we're going to do relationships, action, reaction. Relationships. Relationships. Which Excellent. is something you we'll love to Point talk of view about. perspectives. All yes. four patterns that, that underlie thinking. And That's right. <laughs> how stuff is organized in the world. Um, okay, so if you recall, yeah. my dear, which I'm sure you do, we have a lot to talk about, right? Yeah. So I want to But we're gonna get to we're gonna get to how to practice it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like we did in the other episode. So we're of gonna course. give you kind of a little bit of background, but then we're gonna give you the like super cliff notes on how to practice it called the move there's kind of two moves two moves oh um, yeah r has two moves two that's because r's r is super important yeah that's deep relationships so let's start at the beginning yes yeah we've talked a lot in the previous episodes about dns about our research agenda from years past where we set out to show that these patterns, and in today we're going to talk about relationships, that they exist in nature and in the mind. We also did some research around whether, you know, the the degree of value and effectiveness you get when you're aware of these patterns. Yeah. And then, um, and then we'll kind of land in the move, like how do you actually practice these things? Yeah. So if you, if you if you're new, if you're coming into this at this episode. Mm-hmm. A big part of our research in the last 25 years has been, uh, you know, to DSRP makes all these predictions about these patterns and, and what they uh, what they mean. Mm -hmm. And so, like, one of the predictions is that, that, that this is a form of organization that occurs naturally in yes. the real world. Yes. Right. So we wanted to test that prediction. Yes. And we find that it does. Hundreds and hundreds of research studies show across the disciplines that that it, that these patterns exist. Then we wanted to show that they existed in the mind. Mm -hmm. So we have some research. So we have research around that. Then we wanted to show that if you're aware of them, they have a an effect. So we mm -hmm. call that existential versus uh, effect or affective uh, research. Yep. Right. Yep. And. Um, so we wanted to show that they exist in mind and nature, mind and reality, and that if you're aware of them, it actually increases your effectiveness. Yes, in whatever. And then we wanted to show, we wanted to understand how we're biased. That's right. And so we've done a lot of bias studies. We want to show how people think about these things, tend to think about them, tend not to think about them. Um in lots of different situations. And then we wanted to show, well, what can you do to actually get good at these things? So we know that it's effective, but w can we get you more effective by practice? Right. And the research on that is just mind boggling. Yes. Yeah, so needless to say, we've been busy. Yeah. <laughs> Over the last two decades. Yeah. <laughs> we've been busy. So let's start, um, let's start with relationships as a pattern we see in nature. Yes. So we reviewed, as you said, hundreds of studies mm -hmm. looking at these things. We had a couple of examples that I thought were interesting, one of which was a short video you sent me of um, synapses. Or yeah. Neurons or. Yep. They're, neuron, they're neurons that are in, um, you know, basically Petri dishes. And mm -hmm. it's interesting if you put, you know, a single neuron in a Petri dish it'll try to branch out it'll it literally will try it'll do its darndest to relate to stuff even if there's nothing it's kind of sad if you look at this little neuron because he's like hello, hey, hello. hello is anybody out there you know yeah. and uh he's lonely and he wants to connect yeah right and that is things want to connect mm -hmm. um one of my favorite biologists lynn margulis said said life did not overtake the planet through combat. That's right. 
but through relationships. Yep. Through connection. Yep. And that is deeply true about evolution and um, life on this planet is that, uh, you know, we, we're not just, you know, killing each other mm -hmm. uh, life wise. We're, we're really actually deeply connective. Yeah. And nature is deeply connected, which is why ecologies form. And yeah, um, we see all these interdependencies and webs of life yeah. because of connections. So so when you see those things, remember that at the base of all those things is, is relationships. Yes. So when you, you know, like I was saying, when you put a, a single neuron in a petri dish, that's what happens. But when you put a couple, they connect with each other. They find each they other. They find each other. And they start and those, to interact. And those relationships are material things in and of themselves that are mm -hmm. distinctly different than the neurons, right? Because they're, they're exchanging electrochemical signals and yeah. things like that. So they're, each relationship is a material process that is quite complex. Yes. And that's true for all the relationships yes. in the universe. Well, and you can imagine that's exactly why Facebook became so successful. Yeah. Because all humans are looking to connect and make yeah. bigger and bigger networks. The science of networks, the, yeah. you know, complexity, all these things. Um, you can even see, believe it or not, along those lines, you can see videos of whole um, the galaxies interacting, mm -hmm. one galaxy interacting with another galaxy and forming an, an actual relationship between these two galaxies. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I saw an image that you sent me of that. And what was interesting to me was you've got two things. And then there's this this merge space where there's almost like a third thing. Yeah. Which is the two things interacting becomes a, a separate sort of system in yeah. and of itself, yeah. which is interesting. And the dynamics of that relationship are quite different than the dynamics of what's going on in, in either of those two things. Uh, yeah. And we also, we always joke, <laughs> we've always joked that we have you know, the three kids and yeah. then all of the relationships between yeah, them, absolutely. which become a thing that you have to Yeah, manage. I mean, growing up in a, growing up, I, I experience this every night growing up in a family of, of five kids and, yeah. you know, parents. So there's always seven of us at least at the table. And the dynamics, just sitting there every night, we would have these crazy conversations <laughs> and, and, and the dynamics of sitting at the table every night, I think experientially, I just kind of through osmosis picked up the, uh, you know, kind of a an awareness of the dynamic, just the complexity of the social dynamics. And when, you know, when they're your brothers and sisters and parents and stuff, mm -hmm. you know that when that person says that to the other person, oh, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> or when that, you know, yeah. when that one says the exact same thing yeah. to this one, that's not going to be a problem. So those dynamics become almost visible, you know. But what's interesting about nature is that it hides a lot of its secrets yeah. in relationships. And so being able to see the relationships, bringing relationships to your metacognitive awareness, being able to see relationships that aren't always seen, they're, they're kind of hidden, right? If you're sitting at a table with seven people, you see the people, you hear the conversation, but you don't necessarily see the dynamics. You see a reaction, you see an action, but you don't see the dynamics right. that are happening. And there are crazy social dynamics happening, right? Yeah. A lot of times in nature, it hides a lot of its secrets yeah. in the relationships. So if you look at that Petri dish with the neurons, yeah, you see this neuron and you see that neuron but you, a lot of times you, you just go, oh, they're interacting, but you don't see what's going on in that interaction, right? You see them kind of reaching out and connecting, mm -hmm. but you don't see all the electrochemical signals yeah. that are happening. That's kind of hidden to you. Yeah. Um, so it's just an important thing to remember, and, and awareness of relationships is so critical. Well, another way to think about that is... If so much is happening in those relationships, and so many of those relationships are hidden, by bringing them to the surface and actually seeing them, articulating them, then you're seeing more of the reality of what's happening in front of you, right? Because if you're not paying, if, if they're a substantial part of systems and you're not seeing them, then you're missing a lot. 
Hundo P. Hundo P. Hundo P. <laughs> Did you just make that up? <laughs> no, that's a. That means hundred percent. I know what it means, <laughs> but I just didn't know why you were using it. But I, I don't know. I hundo heard P. It. Yeah. Okay. Hundo Great. Hundo P. Hundred <laughs> percent. There's something. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I'll leave that alone. Okay, so then the other thing I wanted to tell people about, which I thought was interesting, is um, other organisms, other animals exhibit relationship skills, right? So if you remember that study we read on pit vipers, mm -hmm. and um, pit vipers are actually very aware of how much venom they have left right. in there. And they'll actually change their behavior based on the amount of venom they have, right? right. So if, they, if they're locked and loaded... They'll maybe be more aggressive right. than if they have less. They'll be more inclined to, you know, f fight or flight kind of thing. Right. So um, again, that's that's demonstrating that they're 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 making a relationship, mm -hmm. which is not entirely visible, but they're making a relationship between how much venom they have stored and their behavior choices. Right. Uh, right. And so. Yeah, pretty pretty powerful. And you know, I mean, these are just a few examples. There are lit literally a, an uncountable yeah. number of examples of well, relationships happening somewhere. out. And yes, we do have a whole, uh, you know, uh, papers and published papers on all this. But but all you have to do is look around in nature, and you'll see these uh, remarkable relationships uh, everywhere right. you you look. We've done the nature part. So let's talk about relationships exist in nature. Yes. Yeah. And, and what we want to do in our mind is get our mental models in alignment with with nature, right. with reality. We want to love reality. So we want to we want to love reality more than our mental models because that's confirmation bias if we love our mental models more than reality. Mm -hmm. So we want we want to kind of understand that hey, there's relationships out there. And we want to know which ones are real. So our mind makes relationships, but sometimes it makes faulty ones. Sometimes spurious. it makes spurious ones. Sometimes it makes, you know, uh, it's delusional. Sometimes it's um, hallucinates <laughs> sometimes like AI. Sometimes we make AI. relationships for people yeah. to manipulate them. Yeah, or we think yeah. that something happened that didn't happen. So we want to always test. When we make relationships, we want to test, hey, is this, rela is this a relationship that's happening in, mm -hmm. in the real world? Yeah. You know? I want to also just speak into, because in the last couple of episodes, if you haven't seen them, we've been talking about one piece of research, which was a really large sample, which was almost 35,000 mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And just to sort of contextualize it, what we saw was among those 35,000 people, if we reduce that to a sample of 10 people, that five people freeze up. Well, so it's the sample was 35,000 people. Yes. If we, if we use a metaphor of 10 people to represent yeah, that sample. Thank you for slowing me. Yeah. So, yeah. So imagine that you have a team of 10 people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Imagine you're giving them a project. To think Or through. a problem or an mm -hmm. issue to think through, right? And what this study did was it found what they do when when that happens what we tend to do what statistically we tend to do and what we tend not to do right yeah. and as a reminder when you ask a group of 10 people metaphorically to see yeah. statistically we know that five people get stuck they get stuck they don't know what to do five out of ten people half your team gets stuck i'm sure we've all experienced that before yep. but yes and then of the five people that do something what they do is they make Identities uh, identity. of identity. Yeah. They make identities and ignore others. Yes. Yes. And that's the, the distinction part of what they're doing. And then they break things into parts. Two and a half out of yes. ten. Two and a half people out of ten will break things down. But they don't go up a But they won't think about the larger yeah. picture of what's going on. Yes. And so here's the number for R. <laughs> so of your ten people at the table. Yeah. Only one and a half people. One, one and a half. half people. One and a half people actually see relationships at all. Yes, between and among ideas. Which, honestly, it's frightening. It's frightening. It's it's frightening. It's also kind of like yeah, that checks out. 
you know, in real life, in yeah. my experiences, uh, you know, of everybody we talk to is like, yeah, that checks out. Yeah, it's weird. I guess those steps. People don't make relationships. And it's, it, and, and then, you know, compare or contrast that to what we just said, which is nature makes all these relationships. Reality is making all these relationships. A lot of the coolest stuff is hidden in those relationships. And one and a half out of 10 people actually even consider relationships when they're thinking something through. Yes. That's, that's a mismatch that we want to resolve. And frankly, that we need to resolve educationally. We yes. need to get young people from an early age seeing those relationships. Absolutely. Or put more bluntly, we need to stop incentivizing them not to see them. Because that was blunt. one of the studies that we know of, and we know this a lot about children, is that ch even babies, infants, will, will be uh, more interested in things that are causal. That's right. right? They do eye movement studies. They, they yeah. do eye movement studies. And, mm -hmm. and so babies are super attuned to relationships and causality. And like they, they love yeah. to throw things on the floor and then watch you pick them up. And they're like, <laughs> they get a times. great joy out of that because they're like, wait a minute, I just did something. Yeah. And then now she's doing something. And yeah. then let's try that again. Let, yeah. Let's try that with, with this thing over here. Let's throw that on the floor and see what happens. I have to interject yeah. with a funny Alina story. Yes. Because we don't tell Alina stories very often. Oh, boy. But when Alina was still in a high chair, so she was probably one and a half, maybe, yep. um, I was home alone with her. I was making her lunch. And uh, she was in her high chair, and the light was off in the kitchen. And she was watching me run around, making her lunch. And then I went and I turned the light on with the light switch. And she did this like double take. Yeah. And she said, do it again, mommy. And I said, do what again? She goes, the light. And I said, and I flipped the switch. And she was just fascinating. She's like looking at the switch and she's looking at the light. She's looking at the switch. So she's figuring out as a tiny baby that there's this relationship between that yeah. thing and what's happening. That's exactly right. And I swear she did it for an hour. Yeah. And of course I did it for an hour because it was fun to watch. And then she was squealing and she thought I was God. She just thought it was amazing. Yeah. She's like, oh, you make light. They love action, reaction. Yeah. They go. Action, reaction, action. relationships. <laughs> they love it. They yeah. love it, love She's it, love very it. Very excited. They get very excited about it. And then, yeah. Around about third grade, we start, you know, doing the whole standards thing and so over socializing and. Socialization, rather, not socializing, but yeah, over-socialization, yeah. over-control. Conformity. Conformity, all this kind of stuff. These kids are, are natural reality figure-outers. That's a technical term. That's a technical term, but they're, they're natural <laughs> reality figure-outers. Yeah. They figure out reality. Fully. These humans, they're amazing yeah. little little things. Yeah. And they're, they're naturals. They're naturals at it. And then we train them. And then we kind of incentivize them and train them out of this kind of thinking. But it's a natural form of thinking to yeah. see the relationships yeah. between things. And anybody with children will be able to sit and remember that moment or that time, that period of time where they saw that sort of natural curiosity start mm -hmm. to dwindle. Yeah. And it's really around like... Third grade, third grade, fourth grade, and guess what's happening? Yeah. That's when the testing is starting. And, you know, because you remember the kids in the back seat asking you a thousand questions about everything. about everything. They're so curious and they're yeah. trying to make make sense of the world. And then as they get further in school, the conversation gets. Well, and, and that a lot of that beca happens because we're incentivizing them to get the right answer. That's right. But there is no right answer most of the time. There's very, it's very seldom that even when there is a factually right answer, there are multiple ways to look at the thing from multiple perspectives such that you would end up with different right answers. Yes. Not conflicting right answers, but different. You're looking at different parts of the, of the system. And so you're seeing different things, all of which are correct and collectively make up the system. Yeah. But what we do is is uh, we incentivize them to search for the answer that the teacher's looking for. Yes. 
right? Mm -hmm. And then it just becomes like a a a people pleasing activity, right? Yeah. Rather than a reality exploring activity. Yeah. And and I think that's a mistake. And mm -hmm. I think it trains them out of out of natural patterns of thinking that are quite remarkable. That's true. And we we double down on that all the way through high school. And then guess what? When you're prepping for the SAT, what's the first thing your SAT prep course person tells you? We're going to tell you the perspective of the test maker. That's right. So that you can get a better score on this test. It has nothing to do with what you know. In fact, when I was, I used to be a terrible test taker. I'm aware. Yeah, I was terrible in school. I'm aware. <laughs> and part of the reason I was terrible in school is because I couldn't take tests. And part yeah. of the reason I couldn't take tests was because I never realized it until I took the grad tests. Yeah. That I did one of those uh, test preps, and yeah. I was blown away when they shared that with me. They, you know, the number one thing you got to learn is you're not taking a test to test your knowledge. And I was like, what? <laughs> No, you're test taking a test to understand the answer that the test designer wanted. Yeah, and I was like, I was absolutely floored by yeah. that. Because it goes all the way to G you were you're talking about GRE prep. Yeah, so GRE it starts in high school with SAT prep, yeah, and then you absolutely. get to GRE, and then think about MCATs and LSATs. It's and they're all the same, all the same, same. in yeah. that w people that are good at taking tests, they're taking perspective of the test designer. Yeah. Right. And so they're answering according to that, not according to I want to demonstrate yeah. some knowledge about a particular area. And I think we start that process and we start decreasing people's natural patterns of thinking yeah. because we incentivize them to find the right answer. Now, think about real life. Is there is there usually like in, in the complexities of things, not what's the capital of Texas? Yeah, there's a right answer to that. But in the complexity of life, relationships, kids, mm -hmm. job, how many times really is there a right answer? There's 78 different ways you can do something. I think if there you was. you just got to figure out. But I think if there was one, it would be a lot easier. Yeah. But yeah. It's but there almost a, never is a right answer yeah. to, you know, Anything. how to navigate this problem or that problem or this relationship or this customer, you know, yeah. or this product or the, you know, whatever realm you're in, parenting or mm -hmm. life or business or, you know, policy or whatever. It's really sifting through a bunch of different options, but yeah. there's not a lot of right answers in the sense that, you know, Albany's the capital of New York. Hey, good job. You know, you got that. I got that one. Um, <laughs> mostly because I live here. But... <laughs> You, you know, What's like, the capital of Texas? I think it's Austin. I think that's right. Is that right? Well, I mean, who, have you ever been asked what the what a state capital is in a job interview or like on yeah. your first date? Yeah. You're on the first date with this woman that you're really interested in. And she goes, "What's the capital of Iowa?" Des Moines. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> Has it has that ever gotten in the way of things that are important to you? No. No, but now I know what I should have asked you when we first started. <laughs> we would probably like, wouldn't have started because I would have failed that test. No, because that's not something I care about. Exactly, that's the whole point. We don't care. We don't actually care about these because things. Because you can Google it. But yeah, but like our kids, they studied. Oh my God. The not just the state capitals. County. The counties of New York. More than 60 counties. In New Who York. needs to know the counties of New York? Who actually needs to know that? Um, I think some people. Maybe like a land surveyor or. But even that, oh, couldn't you just look it up when you get there? State government. Yes, that, some state. Go like, yeah, I guess if you're like state running government. for office in New yeah. York. But you'd probably have like an assistant or something that would be like, hey, these are the counties. We're going to this one. And you're like, oh, yeah. Well. Extension, cooperative extension has to know. There's sure. a few people. There's a couple people. Yeah. But does everybody need to know that? But I would tell you they probably don't have all 60-something. I'm guessing memorized. they don't need to memorize it. No. I don't think they do. All right. So I think we're, yes, okay. We've gone way off of no, relationships. We're and no, but here's the thing. So back to, reaction, but. here's what you're saying, which is we are naturally born to be relational, to see relationships, to seek out causal phenomenon. Yeah. You're talking about the babies. So our 35,000 people sample was adults, right? Yeah. Um, as adults, we know that we only occasionally relate things. Yeah. And 
what we don't do is we don't distinguish the relationships we're making, right? Yep. We don't break those just those relationships down. We don't into zoom parts. into them and the parts. Into them. Yeah. Um, that's that's using our relationships with distinctions and systems yeah. together to to understand the relationship. That we don't realize that we can and should really zoom in and articulate and explicate, like explain what the relationship what the actually relationship is. is. Yeah. Um, so that's something. There's a classic worksheet, right? Worksheets are oh pretty gosh. popular in education, and and uh, there's a classic worksheet, and it's got like I don't know, I can't remember it's all the like, things. It's got yeah. like, on the left, it's got like you know a toothbrush and a car. And, and a baseball bat. A baseball bat. Yeah. And then on the right, it's got like a baseball and toothpaste and a steering, steering wheel. wheel or yeah. something. And and the the point of the of the worksheet is that the kids draw a line to the right, you know, mm -hmm. making a relationship between the things that are related. And it's always kind of perplexed me that that, that was enough. That just being like there's a relationship there, but not knowing what the relationship is. What is the relationship between those two things? Yeah. That's distinguishing the relationship. Yeah. And then zooming into, you know, the dynamics and the, the remarkable parts of that relationship, because inside of every relationship is like a, it's like a present that you open up like on Christmas or something like that. If you think about a relationship. Not simply as a line, yeah. but a line with a big present on it. And if you rip open that present I like that. and you look into it, mm -hmm. you're going to see a ton of cool stuff happening mm -hmm. in nature. Yeah. And it, the nature will reveal itself through revealing the relationships. Yes. So when you show curiosity in those relationships, nature will, nature meaning reality, yeah. The thing, the situation you're dealing with, nature. Why well, use nature for for everything? I know, I know. Reality, whatever part of reality that you're dealing with, whether it's your family or your job or your whatever. It's uh, it's going to give you this present mm -hmm. that's sitting on the line between two things, the yeah. relationship between two things. Yeah. And I always thought it was weird that 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 they didn't ask for anything more. It was just yeah. like, oh, toothpaste, toothbrush yeah. related. Well, how? How are they related? I think yeah. that's really interesting if you think about, yeah, you know, like what if if toothpaste was made up of marbles, it like paintballs, it totally wouldn't work because you have these bristles, right? And you'd be taking a ball and putting it on bristles so it'd roll off. It'd be very frustrating. You'd have this toothbrush. And, and every time you put some toothpaste on, they would roll off onto the floor. You'd have toothpaste all over the floor, right? Yeah. But there's a reason why toothpaste and toothbrush go together because you've got these bristles and then the, the toothpaste is kind of, it's kind of like sticky and fluidy. And so it goes into this the bristles is. and it holds on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but imagine if toothpaste was like a, like a paintball. Not so much. That'd be a nightmare. What if, what if you could make paintballs full of toothbrush and then shoot people in the teeth? What? That would be hilarious. If make you made paintballs full of toothpaste, toothpaste and they they oh and just shoot them they in the explode teeth. in your mouth like yeah. Uh, yeah. pop rocks well, or in, something. Well, in in okay well, in the well, mountains we have tabs that we chew. Well, why don't we just use those? I use them. No, I mean at home. You could. We have. A, they look like aspirin, and you just pop them in your mouth, and you chew them, and it uses your mouth saliva to yeah. kind of like foam, Catalyze. and then you brush your teeth. Oh, you have to your, have a toothbrush with them. Well, or you could use a stick or something like that, or oh, that some like people fun. just use their finger. Oh, that's really hygienic. I'm talking about the mountain, <laughs> like in the mountains, but but the, um, you know, because the toothpaste tube gets everywhere. Yeah, you know, if it squeezes in your backpack, you got toothpaste yeah, everywhere. Yeah. It's it's nasty. But the little the little but what's interesting about that is it's action reaction, right? Mm -hmm. It's action reaction. And that's what is the those are the underlying elements of relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So it, you know, what is the action reaction of toothpaste in your backpack? It's the action is you know, there's lots of compression, there's lots of squeezing, yeah. there's lots of forces in your backpack. 
and then the toothpaste somehow explodes and the cap comes off whatever and then all of a sudden the you know you've got stuff everywhere it's a mess it's a mess and you smell like mint for the whole time you're hiking which wouldn't be bad but it wouldn't be bad yeah actually. so <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we this one is going everywhere. That's okay. Listen, so we've talked about some of the research around, you know, it exists in nature. It exists. And we're going to talk about the mind thing. Yeah. We were talking about that it's it's a skill that actually we're not really very good at, statistically speaking. We're only occasionally engage in relation, seeing relationships. And then when we do, uh, not only does it not happen much, but we also tend to really focus on... Um, one co- like a cause and effect relationship. We don't see that that like you were saying that things happen in a sort of web of causality, right? So we're really biased towards a simple cause and effect, which is not how things actually exist. We look for linear causal relationships, right? Yeah. So we're biased in that way. Yeah, we. I think the the even the term cause is a really yeah. difficult term, and in science, it's quite debated whether or not there is causality and things like that because. Mm-hmm. I think I think the best thing you can take away from the complexity of all those conversations is simply that there are actions and there are reactions to actions. Mm-hmm. Um, imparting causality into that says something about that relationship that may or may not be true, but there definitely are actions and reactions. And causality usually is kind of a, like a, a much ma- a ma- more macro idea where you have webs of causality. But nothing in the universe is really ever that one single thing causes one single other thing. You know, like, it's usually webs of causality. There are multiple things that are happening across time and space that lead to the the emergence of some condition or some effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, And so really seeing the network of relationships that is behind causality... Yeah. Is critical. Yes. Absolutely critical. Yes. And so maybe that can segue us into sort of bias, the way yep. we're biased. And like, for example, in, in relation, I know in distinctions, we're biased to see identities, not others. Yes. In systems, we sort of are, are better at seeing parts, parts than holes. Than holes. Yeah. So what, what does that hold for R? We tend to see action more than reaction. Um, Meaning the thing that happens. Yeah. The thing that, you know. Something happens. Yep. Yeah. So I th- I threw the ball. Mm-hmm. We see I threw the ball more than he caught the ball. We see, mm-hmm. you know, I went running more than uh, the pavement supported. Yeah, me, yeah, yeah. You know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, we tend to see more actions than reactions. Or in personal relationships, like you did this. Yep. And I'm not paying attention to how I reacted to yes, that, which exactly. is causing that interdynamic. Yes. So I see what you did, but I don't see yeah, my yeah, yeah. reaction. That that's a great, out. that's a, a better example. Yeah, than it the is. The ones I gave. <laughs> yeah, kidding. no, it is. I'm just kidding. So we see that bias, um, the same kind of bias as we in the uh, as we do in the other things. Um, the other thing I know that we, when we talk about um, the Dunning Kruger effect. Mm-hmm. So what's interesting about that is. It seems to me we're overconfident in all of these things, yes. distinctions, systems, relate. But we think we're better at relationships than we are. But our competence level is the lowest in relationships. In relationships. Absolutely. So that yeah. gap might actually be higher. Yeah. Which yeah. is interesting. It's concerning. It goes yeah. beyond interesting. It's concerning it. that that relationships are so important to to see and to understand. In, under, in order to understand systems of any kind, and by systems I mean your kids yeah. are systems, yeah. schools are systems, your business is a system, mm-hmm. your marriage is a system, like all the systems that you care about, yeah, all the systems that are important to you are systems. And in order to understand those systems, you must understand the relationships. Yes. And so it becomes, it becomes very concerning Mm-hmm. If we are literally not seeing the relationships and yes. not good at it, and we think we're pretty good at it, and we're not, yeah. Well, you see it everywhere. Yeah. You see, you see. I mean, many people that I've talked to and you've talked to have said in the last five years, it just seems like nobody can talk to anybody. Yeah. Like that. There's just all of this um, 
difficulty interpersonally. There's a lot of conflict. For sure. There's just all kind, of, and and then there's polarization, and all of the things that we're seeing at a larger level are because of that. Mm-hmm. In terms of effect. Yes. And the and why we need to be able and learn to see the relationships. Remember, we talked about the fish tank study relate, related to the other two. Yeah. We saw the same same effect in um, in our relationships. Yeah. Teach them a one minute uh, written intervention, so one minute treatment, less mm-hmm. than one minute, uh, and we saw highly statistically significant results in terms of increases in complexity and robustness around their thinking. Yeah. Just about something you know a scene the fish tank scene. Right. Um, So again, just being aware of relationships and action-reaction elements makes you more uh, a more robust, more adaptive, more more complex thinker. So we've done that. We've done a version of the fish tank live in different groups, Mm -hmm. and one of the things that's really interesting to me with when people for the groups that that get the treatment of relationships, where they learn about that one pattern. The other groups are just pointing out stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a fish, there's gravel, there's a castle, there's this, there's that. And then the R group comes in, and their first responses before they've learned R are the same thing. Fish, gravel, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But then they learn the the relationships role. And their next set of answers are, oh, there's a fish that's interacting with another fish. And then there's bubbles that are coming out of the thing that means there's oxygen interacting with, you know. And so it's a totally different view. Yeah, they're they're seeing... In the case of the fish tank study, it becomes very obvious because the fish tank is just a picture yeah. of a fish tank. Yeah. They're seeing things that don't exist in the picture. They're right. seeing things that exist dynamically in the reality of the fish right. tank. And um, so they're imagining yeah. these these dynamics. And in that sense, they're seeing more of the scene um, and that's true whenever we start seeing uh, relationships and and perspectives Uh, so that you know distinctions of identity the other is tends to be the unseen but uh and part whole you know the parts tend to be seen Mm -hmm. those tend to be things that would show up in a picture the identities and the parts they show up in a picture you can see the parts of my shirt right you can see the shirt you can see those things but the relationships are not always visible and we see that more when when people are made aware just by awareness that's crazy to me that like you know just a little bit of awareness can have such a huge effect okay so let's let's talk about um in the mind the things we did in the mind to to test whether or not we could see people the, the the actual skill of making the yeah. relationships and, and the nature of how people are making relationships when they're thinking about things. Yeah. Yeah. So if you remember, we started with, um, well, we had several different questions, but we'll, we'll share a few that, that illustrate the point. So there was one where we had a square. Yeah. So pr- it's hard to explain, but well, we can we put could, a picture up yeah, or I can draw it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you, you kind of in, in the first situation, you have a, a square. You label A. And it labeled A. And we asked them, you know, is how would you name this? Would you name it square, big square? Yeah. Or large square, sorry. Medium Medium square or small square, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, some percentages name it. Yeah. Yeah. So this was 55. 55%. 26. 26%. 14. 14%. And 3. 3%, right? So... In this case, eighty percent of people kind of labeled it. Fifty-five percent of people just said, "Oh, well, it's a square, right?" Because yeah, that's yeah. all they're seeing. And so this gives you that baseline. Yeah, it's some people saw it as a small square, some people saw it as a medium square, some people saw it as a large square, and some people saw it as a yeah. as a, just a square. Yep. Then we do the same exact square. Yep. But. There is a uh, little square to the left of it, which yeah. is labeled B. Yeah. And in that case, question. we get and we ask them the same question. 
Yeah. And identify then, A and. So then, what do you what do you call um, A? Was yeah. the question, and so then you got six percent, and then you got seventy five percent called it a big square. Eight percent and nine percent. Now that might not seem interesting to people, but tell them why it's interesting. Well, what's really interesting about it is 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 that this number increased by almost 50 percent mm-hmm. right that that suddenly and this number decreased dramatically yeah. right so suddenly a is the same it's the same square but it's relative to b relative exactly. meaning related relative related there's so what they're telling us is that they created without us asking them to they created a relationship between A and B that altered they, how they perceived A. How they defined it, yeah. How they defined A. It altered what they would name A. It altered the way they saw A. And so that relationship, which is not visible, that they weren't asked to make, they just automatically make it. Yeah. Uh, and then in the third example... So you've got the same size square, but we've changed it to C. Yeah. And then this square becomes A, and then there's another then square. Then this square was A, Yep. and this square was B. Yep, and we asked the same thing. We asked the same thing, a. define A. Right, and so then for here, you had 3%, 3%, 10%, 10%, 82%, 82%, 82%. 82%. and 5%, 4%. 4%. Yeah. So again, now now A becomes the medium square because they're relating it to this and they're relating it to this. Right. And this might seem simple, but just make it people, right? So like I'm here and I'm part of a podcast team. Sure. And then I walk into my kitchen and I'm mom and I'm making snacks. Yes. Right? And then Yeah, I we go, do this all the time yeah. as humans. You you you're you're at work. Yeah. You're the boss. You you're relating to people in mm-hmm. one way. You go home, and you're the dad, and you're relating people in another way. You go to Thanksgiving with your whole family, and mm-hmm. you're the little brother, and okay. you relate a different way, right? <laughs> yeah. You're you know you go to the park, and you're you mm-hmm. know the park ranger. You're gonna interact differently. So those relationships really change the identities. They change the perspective. Right. And, and what's really interesting about this study, which is one of the things that we were testing, mm-hmm. uh, because D- like I said, DSRP makes a bunch of predictions. One of the predictions is that R, the relationship rule or pattern, is has an interdependency with D and vice versa. Yes. Right? And this is what this is showing. This is showing that actually the identity of A, the identity of A, yeah, the identity of A will change based on how and who it's relating with. Yes. Right? Yes. And so what this is showing is A was mostly, you know, s- square, and then it became mostly large square, and then it became mostly medium square. And it just... It did that pretty quickly yeah. based on who it was with. And that's happening all the time about anything that we're thinking about. Yeah. And we don't know that. That's we're right. not always aware of that. And we want to be aware of that. Yeah, we could even, you can even have a relation, a dependency with S, right? So if we have a bunch of parts mm-hmm. and they're all relating and we're all happy with it, the way they're relating and we kind of, and then we add one more part, mm-hmm. it changes the whole dynamic, right? Yeah. Just like you, you add a person to a party or you add a feature to a, yeah. to a car or, you, you know, then all of a sudden you get a very different dynamic. Yeah. The whole thing changes. The whole thing can change. Okay. So, so that's good because that, that was um, real evidence of the relational way in which we define things mm-hmm. and the interdependency between two. And not only that, but that people do it automatically. They don't automatically. It subconsciously. Yeah, there's a whole field called neuromarketing, which ironically, I mean, there's a certain irony here, neuro, so this is neuroscience, mm-hmm. and then marketing. So the the irony is that this is a field that is a relationship between two fields. And, you know, so this is fractally happening all the time. Neuromarketing is all about using our understanding of how the brain works 
Mm -hmm. to get us to do stuff in marketing. So we're constantly being being secretly affected by these things, right? Yes. Because neuromarketers know if I put two things together, you'll make a relationship. I don't even have to tell you to make a relationship. I don't even realize we're doing it. You don't even yeah. realize you're doing it. Happy meal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're making a relationship that I kind of made for you. Yeah. Right? And you, you'll just go along with it. Yep. If I say Coke is life, you go, oh, Coke is life. Is Coke life? Really? Yeah. No, it's not. But but yeah. Coke is life. You know, Coke yeah. is friendship. We're yeah. probably not going to get sponsored by Coke or, uh -huh. or McDonald's. But, but that's okay. Uh, that's that's okay. okay. I don't, they're that's all goop. goop. So we don't want to be <laughs> sponsored by them. Um, but the point being, marketing... You know, politics, yeah. they're constantly using relationship rule and in many ways leveraging the fact that they know that you're not paying attention yes. to relationships and that they can get you to think relationships without knowing that you're thinking relationships. Yes. They're using that all the time to get your time, your attention, your vote and your cash. Cash for sure. All but, of it. Yeah. Sometimes they're, <laughs> your time, your attention is more valuable than the cash in your wallet. Because then they can turn you into a product and sell it to other people. Yeah, that's right. Right? That's what the social right. media is doing. They're just getting yeah. your attention. Yeah. Right? And then they sell it. Well, and I would say, just because it's sort of part of my thing, is during an election year, you should be paying attention to the relationships that are being made for you. 100%. And There's a lot of relationships being made for you that are completely spurious. Yes, to get your vote. To get your vote, to... to so test them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> then we did another study, which we called the dog lab coat study, which was really meant to test the effect of um, co-priming ideas together. Meaning yes. how does knowing one idea influence the way you think about another idea? Yeah, we actually had to... Uh, coin that new term co-priming for this uh, for this study because research is very familiar with priming mm -hmm. which is something that we use all the time in, in research studies but co-priming means that you have two things that are co-affecting simultaneously changing the other mm -hmm. um, so you can for example have two things that are changing the meaning of each other yes. simultaneously. Yes. And that's called co-priming. That's right. So because we were looking at co-priming, we mm -hmm. had to start by establishing a baseline of what people thought typically of the ideas. So we did have them describe a dog, we had them describe a lab, and we had them describe a coat. And, mm -hmm. and in general, a dog was a furry four-legged animal in people's minds. Um, a coat was a uh, like a, Tended to be a winter coat. Like a winter yeah. coat. And then the lab was a, like a scientific laboratory. So that's what we know people were thinking those things were. Yeah, individually. Individually. Yeah. We set out to test what they, what they would, how we could change mm -hmm. what they were thinking of each of those things by co-priming them with one, one another. So yep. we started by asking them, um, we gave them the word um, lab and ask them to describe the coat. So yes. we're looking at the effect of the idea of lab on, on the concept of coat. Yes. And you remember what happened there? Yeah, the winter coat became transformed mm -hmm. magically, mm -hmm. not magically, but, uh, you know, statistically transformed into a white lab coat. Right. So we could right. see the effect of that, pri that priming effect yep. of lab influence how they thought about because they related coat. the two. Yeah. How it they changed the structure and the parts yes. and the whole yes. and the identity of the coat. Yes. So then what we did is we asked them to describe the lab, but they were given the word dog ahead of it. Yeah. So they were they were co primed with dog and lab. And yep. then they described the lab differently. They described the lab as a labrador. Yes. Rather than a laboratory. <laughs> that was well done. Yeah. Yeah. So their idea of lab. Went from being a, like yeah. a chemist lab. Yeah. To a Labrador retriever, essentially. And then the last thing we did is we explored the effect of dog as a co-prime on the concept coat. Mm -hmm. 
So we asked them to describe a coat, but we had co-primed them with the idea of dog. Yes. And then their description changed pretty dramatically. Yeah, it was it, that one was I think split if I remember correctly mm -hmm. between they essentially saw coat as being a uh, fur essentially like mm -hmm. a dog's coat natural coat. Yes. Or alternatively, they thought of like a of an actual jacket that had four like a dog's jacket. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Like that had four holes in it. Right, which is interesting. Yeah. Because it it had two different outcomes, yep. but they yep. were both as a result of that. But all both were very different from yeah. the winter coat that that they saw in the in the baseline. Yeah, and the reason this is interesting, I think, mm -hmm. is I don't think people are aware of the influence of one thing on an on another when they're thinking about things. That's why you were saying they're easily manipulated by people making relationships right. for them constantly. Right. Yeah, we're so. constantly sensitive to all these co-primings that are happening all the time and they're just little relationships um between concepts in this case you know that are yeah. happening instantaneously in our heads and can be manipulated changed uh visually mm -hmm. outerly you know linguistically all kinds of things yes yes um yeah. It's just fascinating, you know, that we have these ideas and they can just dynamically change. I mean, imagine that's the amazing thing about the mind, right? Is that the the, the laboratory mm -hmm. became a Labrador. Yeah. In a split like, second. In real life, that would be hard to do, right? <laughs> yes. It would be hard to turn to for a labo a scientific laboratory to immediately transform into a dog that's like barking and yeah. hunting pheasants or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but in the mind, you do it that fast. You, yeah. A laboratory becomes a, becomes a Labrador. Yeah. A, a winter jacket becomes fur. That's happening it's all the time. That fast. And then the last part of our research was on um, how we actually can get better at these skills. Yes, uh, Last through years. practice. Through practice. We know that you can get better at these skills just by being made aware of them. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to know what happens if we um, practice, if we actually have a, something that we can practice and get better at, what will be the effect? Yes. And so there are, as we said at the beginning, there's two moves related to relationships. Yeah. One is called Park Party and one is called RDS. So yeah. let's talk about... RDS barbell. Let's talk about part party first, which is sure. the idea that we don't, we can break things into parts, but we don't actually see relationships between and among those parts. Yeah. So part party, I, part party is one of these moves that kind of lives in a lot of places. Uh, you know, it, it definitely lives in R mm -hmm. in relationships, but it's also part of S because yeah. what we want to see is when we're when we're thinking about a whole and breaking it down into parts one of the things we want to do is understand that the relationships are part of the whole mm -hmm. that that and and that is like a profound understanding of systems that yeah. that most people don't possess yes in fact most experts don't possess that the relationships are part of the whole in fact systems thinking makes all kinds of crazy claims about about the whole being greater than the sum mm -hmm. and the parts and all this kind of stuff which which are super faulty but we'll go into that in another <laughs> podcast episode but we want to see the relationships as part of the whole and we want to see the relationships between the parts of the whole between and among the parts of the whole yes and so part party is literally just that. That's all it is. It's not we're not even getting into what are the relationships. We're just getting into see the relationships. Just yeah. see that there are relationships between them. And the reason yeah. that that is such an important move is because so few people do it. In in our research, so few people yeah. do it. So few people recognize the relationships. So part party is just saying it's making a simple analogy to to like a, a rager right because <laughs> parts like to party parts like to party right which is people like to party 
what makes a good party it's uh, if you have people sitting on the edges of the you know, like in chairs like not talking to people sitting on the edge not dancing not interacting not mm -hmm. relating that's a terrible party you don't want to go to that party right would you want to go to that party no i would not go to i don't that. think most people would want to go to that party right where everybody's like wallflowers on the on the we've been to parties right? like that before most of us and they're not yeah, there. Like, it's like a seventh grade dance, yeah, right? Like everybody's like lying in the walls, <laughs> right? Well, parts like humans don't want to go to that party. <laughs> no. So we called it part party for this reason. And it has a little exclamation point after the party to name the move. So it's called part party exclamation, exclamation point move. Because of the aforementioned rager. And because it needs yeah. to be a rager. Parts yeah. want a rager. <laughs> they they want to rage. They want to have like it's like a, a visa yeah. or something like for parts. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And uh, and and so the way to get a part party going is to start relating the parts. That's it. Yeah, I mean, and and just as a as an example, when when I see people mapping out systems, they're listing parts. Yeah, it's like here's system A and it has twenty parts, and yeah. here's system B and it has five. Yeah, so we want to go from the zoom in move that we taught you, which is is essentially listing parts. Mm -hmm. We want to go from that model. What part party does is it takes those three parts and it says, oh, I bet they're related. Let's see if they're related. Right? Yes. So it's that simple. This is the transition between the zoom in move and the part party move. Right. And what's remarkable about part party is no matter how many parts you have, Let's say you had four parts, or let's say you had five parts, right? No matter how many parts you have, there's a very simple little equation that you can use to understand how many relationships there's going to be, Yeah. how many relationships between the parts, and that's n times n minus 1, and you can do it divided by 2, right? Right. So what that means is for... A system that has three parts, it's three times two divided by two is going to be six divided by two is going to be three, one, two, three. Right. Right. For, let's test it with four, four parts, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be four times three divided by two. So that's 12 divided by two. So that's six. Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. And it'll be the same, same for part five, and it'll be the same for 27 or 362. Yeah. So that's a good way to do it. It's going to be 362 times 361 divided by two. That's how many, if yeah. you had a thing that had 362 parts in it, yeah. I don't know what that equals, but whatever that equals is how many relationships you're going to have. Right. Right. And if you don't divide by two, then you can look, that'll give you double that number. So that's getting at the action reaction mm -hmm. variables of those relationships. Right. And so that's all that that's all that uh, part party move is doing is it's getting you to see the relationships. Mm -hmm. And then what RDS barbell does. Just hold on. Because things don't yeah. exist in reality, in no, lists. They don't exist like this. This is not yeah, reality. Yeah, that's a really good point. This is real. This is more closer to reality. This is because it seems sort of superficial, but it's because this is not reality yeah. based. Yeah. This is. And yeah. so we want to make sure we're asking ourselves once we've done this, what are the relationships among these parts? That's right. And then right. that moves you to here. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's super important. Part party is probably the most underestimated move of the five most important Definitely. moves yeah. because people go, oh, all you're doing is like drawing lines between things. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but like yeah. literally 85% of people, literally from our study yeah. that we shared earlier. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. So kind of important. Well, so then once you recognize that there are relationships, then that moves you into... That moves you into the RDS barbell move, which just is a barbell. We call it a barbell because it, you know, if you think about a relationship between any two objects, it kind of looks like a barbell. Yeah. So that's the relationship part is the doing the part that you do in part party. So this is a, 
a part party of two, mm -hmm. you're going to make that line, which is the relationship. Yes. Well, an, that's an R bell barbell. An RD barbell is, well, once you've made that relationship, distinguish what the relationship is. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for example, if um, if you had like sandwich and mayo, huh. maybe the relationship would be like, you know, moisture. Mm -hmm. You're adding moisture to the sandwich. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to be too dry. Yeah. Right. So then we would call that an RD barbell because we related it and then we distinguished the relationship. And then yeah. we want to zoom in and make a part party, I mean, a, a zoom in uh, of, of, the of the relationship. Yep. So we want to think about parts of mm -hmm. the relationship. Yes. So we'll try this with something a little more advanced uh, than sandwich. And mayo. <laughs> and mayo. Like we could do, uh, what would be a good one to do? Uh, you could do... Um... You could do engineering and sales. Yeah, so en engineering and sales. And what's the relationship between them? A product manager. Product manager or product management. And what would that, what would be the parts of that? Customer feedback. Customer feedback. Design specs. Design features. specs, features. Yeah, all user that. stories. Yeah. You know, all that kind of stuff, right? So that would be called the RDS because you're making this, you're turning this thing into a system. So you make the relationship, you distinguish the relationship, and you systematize the relationship. And that's where we get the the letters R, D, and S. And we call that generally a barbell because it looks like a barbell. Now, remember, we just did part party of three parts. Mm -hmm. And it had three relationships. Well, all three of those relationships could be each relationship is an RDS. Right. And if we did four parts, if we had a system that had four parts, then there's six possible RDSs. So what, what that means is any, any posited relationship between two things should be considered to be an RDS, meaning you should distinguish it. And break it down into its parts to better understand it when it's inside of your scope or your feasibility. Yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't say you should. I would say you could. In reality, those relationships are RDSs. Yes. Whether or not you need to give time and energy to understanding that particular RDS, like say, for example, in this case, maybe maybe you don't need to understand all of these maybe you just need to understand these three because for the scope or the issue yeah. at hand you're really concerned with those three but guaranteed if these things are relating they are rds's right but in your example like say i'm studying a, an initiative yes well maybe the three relationships i care about because I have influence over them are, are these. So I would do the work to RDS these, and these are somebody else's responsibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other thing that's really important to, uh, to understand, and we'll use a, an example of a, a people network. So say you have these people like this. Mm -hmm. So instead of four generic things, you have four people. Not all things in a system are related. The things that are not related are as important as the things that are related. So, for example, in this system, these two folks don't know each other. Yeah. So they're not related. Right. And that's an important part of the dynamics of the system is that this is not related. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at relationships, we start to interact with identity other of distinctions of, yes, these are related and this is not related. Right. But right? The, yeah, but the point is you're understanding the system as it is. Yes. And so it's very important. Like if you take terrorist networks or something, it's very it's as important who's not related in that network yes. as who is related. Right. Right. What I think about this is I've long said that I think RDS is one of the most valuable and underused things of the things that we teach. And in the context of our Cornell students, they're analyzing things where there's a lot of relationships, yeah. very big, wicked systems, but they have influence over maybe one or two. And so they do the work to say what what is – they really study this relationship. It's like any doctoral mm -hmm. yep. thesis, right, where yep. you're zeroing in on 
one and breaking it down. That's right. Um, so that's part party and RDS, and then you can mash them up. Mash them up. And those are the two moves that are most associated with relationships, action, reaction, relationships. I think that there are there are others, but these are the two most important ones. Yes. And in our moves research, I think we found... Um, I'm trying to remember I forget the number, the number but... Uh, maybe three points? Three, 336 yeah. uh, X fold uh, increase. In, in problem solving abilities, decision. Yeah, 336% increase or 3.36 uh, X mm -hmm. in problem solving on a complex problem solving problem. By knowing to look for the relationships and yep. articulate them. By looking for, well, so this was two moves, right? Oh yeah, let me find so it. We should find that. Part party was 2.47 X increase. So 247 X increase. And RDS was uh, 5.08 or 500% oh. increase in problem solving. We underestimated yeah. it. 508%. Yeah. Yeah. In problem solving and in problem solving. In complex sort of thinking. Yeah. That's pretty remarkable. So a, a 250% and a 500% increase in problem solving ability on a complex task. Yeah. Just uh, by knowing those just two Just by moves. Being, being trained in, for one minute in these moves. Yes. That's, uh, that's impressive. Well, I feel like we've been on a long journey this time. There's a lot in here. Yeah. With relationships. Yeah, we could do like another 30 hours on relationships. I think we'll probably end up doing another one when we get into Do you think the... people would listen to a 30-hour podcast? I don't know how I to I don't think so. <laughs> I would say probably not. <laughs> probably not. No, I I'm just not sure kidding. I would want them to. No, I wouldn't want to do a 30-hour podcast. Time. But I'm, I, you know, I'm saying that as a relationships is something that you can mm -hmm. spend your whole life really deeply under. I mean, all of these things, distinction, systems, relationships, yeah. perspectives, I've spent my whole life understanding better and better and doing research as you have too. And yeah, and relationships is just so cool and so important. And if you understand them and you do these very simple things, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to spend your whole life studying them because we're giving you kind of the the cheat notes for them, yeah. which is first see the relationships between the parts yes. of your system, yes. whatever your system is. Mm -hmm. And second, zoom in, distinguish, and then zoom into those relationships. Yes. And if you do that, you're going to see so much more and, uh, it's just going to be like it's going to be like taking a black and white image and putting it in 3D color. Oh yeah, I like that you know? analogy. That's and, good. Uh, it's good. It's like the difference between those two things. So. Yeah, and I would say when I was first, you know, way way back, sort of learning this stuff for myself, way way back, one of the things I did is I just sort of reminded myself to ask, oh, are these things related? And then if they are. What is that relationship? How would I better understand it by breaking it down into parts? So it's literally see it everywhere. See it in, you know, the relationship between how you feed three dogs at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. all the different parts and pieces. It's just, you know, how do you get your kids to take the trash out? You yeah. Know, all kinds of stuff. Or why are you buying the particular box of cereal yes. at the grocery store? Mm -hmm. You know, n not cereals goop so watch our episode on goop but <laughs> but like why are you attracted to, to that particular things. box mm -hmm. does it have anything is it related at all to the height that it's been put at and mm -hmm. who put it there and who paid to have it there right is it related at all to the verbiage that they're that they've researched you you know, they, they know who you are. Inside they know their brain. buyer and they're getting into your head and they're they're manipulating things you care about. Mm -hmm. Is it is it targeting that? Mm -hmm. Is it being kind of elusive about the relationships between things and just sort of saying, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're listening to the next debates, pay attention. Pay attention. What are the relationships that are being made for you? Ask Why yourself. is that person saying that? What yeah. relationship are they trying to get you to make? Yep. Uh, what relationship are they trying to get you not to make? Yeah. 
right? Yeah. And and just pay attention to this little guy in here and what it's doing and why it's doing it and which mm-hmm. relationships it's making and not making and um, and yeah. why based on based yeah. on these external stimuli. Yeah. Because a lot of like you said, politics, marketing, all of it. products, a lot of it is just manipulating these invisibles. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I would say is sometimes I also am paying attention to the spurious relationships I'm making. Totally. Which I do sometimes. I'm like, why am I relating that to that? And then I yeah. sort of test the veracity of that relationship if for myself. Uh, and that can change things a lot. Yeah. Um, all right, well, there you have it. Is that a wrap? That's a wrap. That's a wrap. That was good. Right. That was really good. Hopefully that has been useful and a little bit of a deeper dive. And what are the other things? Oh, we have to tell them. Like, subscribe. <laughs> like, forget. subscribe, comment, <laughs> download. Tell your friends. And as always, we appreciate you listening. We appreciate we're rising up the ranks. Yeah. And uh, we will definitely see you next time.